Good morning, and thank you all for being part of the Power of We Workforce Diversity Conference today. I'm Dahlia Qualls, Senior Vice President and Chief Communications Officer for Blue Cross. And it's my pleasure today to introduce a special segment we're calling CEO Conversations. Ron Harris, our Vice President of Corporate Workforce Diversity, will be joined by J.D. Hickey, our President and CEO, to discuss what intentional diversity and inclusion looks like from a CEO and board perspective, why top performing companies view being diverse and inclusive as the right way to do business, and how intentional inclusion helps create a culturally competent workplace where everyone is valued, respected, trusted, communicated with, and part of the team. As John referenced earlier this morning, Ron likes to call Blue Cross a mature diversity and inclusion company. But we still recognize we have much to learn. And like many of you, we've had to navigate some challenging waters over the last year. We hope that by sharing some insights and some of our lessons learned during this discussion, you'll be inspired on your own diversity and inclusion journey and that you'll gain some actionable takeaways to help you grow and develop your own programs and adapt to the changing diversity and inclusion landscape. So now, let's join the conversation with J.D. and Ron. Thank you, J.D., for being here with us. Glad, Glad to be have here. You. Thank Look you. Look forward to chatting with you today. Let me, let me just start that, you know, our diversity initiatives have evolved over the years. And I'm really excited and looking forward to hearing your ideas about what you attribute that to. We often say that we are a mature diversity uh, organization. What are your thoughts around that? I'm going to paint with too broad a brush. Okay. But uh, I think in general, I think there's two types of companies when it comes to diversity and inclusion. I think there are those that would say they take it seriously. They've got somebody on their extended leadership team who has that title, who spends their day focused on it. They have a list of actions that they can point to, um, probably some public statements where they've committed. Uh, and I think you also have those companies in contrast that have made it a true top business priority. Uh, and the distinguishing features there are they spend real time on that topic as a leadership team and as a board, they measure it, they track it, they tie their compensation metrics to it, and probably most importantly, they hold each other accountable to it. And I, I think that's the that's the the difference in in those two types of companies and those who have a mature program or not. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you've been the CEO since 2015, and in that period of time, diversity, inclusion, cultural competency has grown exponentially in our company. What do you attribute that to? What are, your, what are some of your thoughts around how we've been able to move? Uh, listen, I'd, I'd just go back to the, to the discussion we just had. I think what you saw was, um, if you go back before 2015, Blue Cross has been blessed to have an open and positive culture for a long time. Uh, long before me and probably even before you. Um, and our board uh, really first movers. A lot of credit to our board for, uh, for uh, demonstrating diversity and inclusion as a priority, uh, probably in advance of the company even. Um, but I think what you've seen since then is be us becoming intentional about it. Uh, and that, that really comes about uh, from spending real time on the topic. Uh, 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 looking at our results, looking at the work we have to do, and, uh, and holding our account, ourselves accountable for advancing that agenda. Now, I'm gonna to have to give you a little bit of a shout out. I know that's not how you operate, uh, but I do think it's important uh, for me to say this in the role that I play in this company because I've always felt, and we continue to feel, and it was implicit in the comment that you just made, because diversity, inclusion, cultural competency, for it to be successful, it has to be top down. It cannot be bottom up. People have to be held accountable. And my shout out for you 
is that you've always seen it that way and you've demonstrated it in through your leadership even prior to your becoming CEO. We are really uh, blessed to have the type of leadership team we have, but I do want to recognize that your video also matches your audio and for that I'm, I'm really grateful. Uh, so let me move to the next question if you don't mind. Uh, with any ambitious and complex organization uh, and with initiatives like those that we have, uh, there's bound to be some differences of viewpoints. I would love to say that we just all stack hands and it's a great kumbaya moment. Obviously it isn't. And so what do you attribute that to? Oh, um, listen, these are hard discussions. I think if this happened naturally, uh, we most companies would be a better place on this topic. Um, I can think of two examples, um, particularly early on, where uh, some of the decisions and the path forward was contentious. Maybe maybe we talk about those. Um, one of them was uh, when we decided to set metrics and tie compensation. Um, there's a whole bunch of companies that have done similar, taken similar actions where they put incentives around the hiring process. So a very common metric when I talk to other CEOs and other companies is making sure that uh, the, your interview panel has a diverse pool before you move forward with interviews and, and an offer. Uh, that's great, we do that as well. Uh, but we took it one step further and said, we're actually going to tie our metrics to who you actually hire and the change in representation of the makeup of your department as well. Uh, and I, let's be clear, we could have spent a lot of time getting sideways on the framing of that. Uh, is it functioning as a quota or otherwise? I think we brushed that off and said, if it, this is going to be important to us, we're going to go to the heart of it and we're going to measure the outcome that we truly want. Um, uh, the other example that comes to mind is uh, when we made the decision to include uh, diversity inclusion as part of our succession planning. Uh, one of the very tactical results of that uh, is that we're now having our most senior one-on-one -on -one leadership conversations with the board uh, around how you doing uh, with the diversity agenda within your department. Um, and I, I just I challenge other companies, pretty much every company I can think of has some outlier departments that haven't moved the needle as much when it comes to representation. Um, and how often in those companies do those senior leaders have to stand up in front of their boards uh, and defend why they're not doing more, why they haven't done better yet. Uh, and that's a critical piece of this. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and, and part of it, too, is we hold people accountable. You said that, but I don't think that can be said enough. And I think that's important to demonstrate that type of leadership and get the commitment across the board uh, from our leaders in the company, because that's, that's how we've been successful. It's not a one man job. And so it's important that other companies and that we continue uh, our focus there. You talked a little bit about uh, the diversity panels. Uh, we look at our applicant pool, but more importantly, we look at our candidate pool and look at who's being trained and making sure that everyone has access to success. And I think that's an incredible uh, part of the work that we continue to do here uh, going forward. So most companies talk about their engagement and we all talk about the importance of communication. From your chair, how does cascading information and having these types of communication opportunities, how does that inform the work that we do? When, when you hear feedback from our colleagues, how does that move you? What, what are your thoughts around that? I know you're a big communicator in you, and you, uh, you believe in sharing ideas and thoughts and strategies. Oh, goodness. Um, so maybe I can't help but to put that in the context of the last year. Um, but I, listen, two big takeaways in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. Um, one was uh, we, we were not 
doing a good enough job at listening uh, and creating dialogue. Um, and I think in the wake of that, so many of us were freshly reminded and surprised at the amount of hurt and pain that many of our diverse colleagues felt on a day-to-day -day basis. And the reason we were surprised and freshly reminded was we weren't asking the question to begin with and we weren't having those dialogues. And so I, I think that's what's a big, I think a big part of the actions that we've taken um, in response have been to make sure we're having those conversations uh, in, in, in multiple settings, in formal settings and in informal settings and in big ones and, and, uh, and in small ones. Um, and that's uh, uh, in structured ones and non-structured ones. Um, and I think that's, uh, you simply can't do enough of it would be the short answer. Good. I, I do recall those and I do recall the pain that was experienced and expressed uh, in some of those meetings, but I thought it was the right thing to do at the time. And even as the leadership team, uh, you led us in conversations about uh, subsequent anyway uh, to the George Floyd murder. What are we going to do differently? What type of company are we going to be? And I do think that having those types of listening sessions, and in particular, that they were led by the leadership team, was was vitally important. Vitally important. So, and we continue them in certain in, in certain fashion. Uh, those events uh, still impact us uh, as we move forward. Certainly, uh, can you talk also? Uh, about the series of conversations, and maybe you've already said it, but I just want you to be a little bit more um, respond, re respond a little bit differently, or uh, expand it anyway. Some of the things that we did as the CEO, did they give you any heartburn? Were you, were you in? Uh, for the most part, no. Um, if I think about the public statements we made, um, why don't I start there and we'll, we'll we great. can step forward. Um, listen, I, as a the companies have all sorts of profiles when it comes to speaking out publicly on public affairs, uh, and for the most part, we're reticent. I think uh, I think our belief is we impact communities primarily by the way in which you do business, not by the size of our megaphone or. Uh, the number of followers on our Twitter account, uh, but this was different, and I think it it demanded uh, it demanded a, a collective response. We were glad to join it, um, and if nothing else, I think we felt the need to stand with our diverse employees, even if nobody else heard that message. Um, I think we were we wanted to say it on behalf of our own employees. Uh, so n no heartburn there at all. Um, I do. What was painful were the conversations. I mean, you know it because you were sitting side by side with me, but those were hard. Um, a lot of um, uh, a lot of awkward silence, a lot of tears, uh, a lot of um, uh, tense moments, um, uh, as you can imagine, as people were um, were sharing parts of their lives that, uh, frankly, they probably hadn't shared before in a work setting before. Uh, that was the part that was toughest. By yeah, I, I think you're right because even in my role, trying to lead those conversations, but feeling some of the same things um, was pretty tough at times. But I tell you, it was absolutely worth it. It was absolutely worth absolutely. it. And so for that, I'm, I'm, I'm really appreciative. I tell you what, let me shut up for a little while. <laughs> and. Uh, if you have some questions and comments that you, <laughs> uh, goodness, uh, I'm thinking of other other actions from the last year. I mean, you can re you can remind me of the list too. But uh, Juneteenth was another one, making that uh, an official uh, paid holiday. Um, and I think that came from I can think of three reasons why, in retrospect, we made that. One was I mentioned earlier we weren't listening enough. Uh, well, when we went out and polled our employees and our diverse employees, what should we be doing? What are the right set of actions in response to this moment? That was number one. Um, and so the part of that was if we're going to do a better job listening, uh, we can do worse than, than start with uh, what employees are telling us is important. 
uh, I think the second part of that was it was, we thought it was an important signal that this was different. Um, I can't remember the last time we made a new paid holiday for our company. My guess is it was in the 80s with MLK, um, but I could be wrong, right? But it's, it's certainly not something we do on a regular basis if even a once a decade basis. So it felt like it was a pretty big symbol that we're treating this differently. Um, the third one was by its nature, it happens every year. Uh, and I think we were very committed on the front end. You and I had this discussion multiple times that we didn't want this to be a surge and retreat. Um, we wanted this to be a, 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 a right hand turn where we were fundamentally different going forward forever. And, and so the, the nature of that as a recurring holiday was important to us. Listen, I'm glad you brought that one up because that one was important and it was suggested primarily by our workforce. And uh, what was really important about it, we also saw the value in education around Juneteenth. And so we made a concerted effort to ensure that our company, our leaders in our entire organization understood the value of it as well as the significance of it. And as I recall, we did a number of things, a number of educational opportunities. We brought in a subject matter expert from Galveston, Texas, and supported uh, initiatives all over the state. Uh, I thought that was powerful uh, because it was something brand new. And many people, unfortunately, had never heard of Juneteenth. And so I thought that was a great way uh, to began our celebration and recognition. I agree. That was a topic a lot of people hadn't heard of, um, and so it drew people in. What, what, tell me more, right? That was the, I heard over and over again. Um, yeah, and our communications team did a great job of publicizing all of the events, the volunteer opportunities. Even in the, during the COVID, we had people who were volunteering. Uh, to serve in our communities and the members we serve across the state. So, yeah, that was a good opportunity for us. One that I'm very proud of. Me too. Absolutely. Me too. So. <laughs> uh, goodness. Um, I think let's, looking back on the year, and if I think about the employee reaction to the set of actions we've taken in response, I think the headline is overwhelmingly positive. Um, and you see the same feedback I do if we look at our engagement survey, if you think about our group discussions or even one-on-one uh, one -on -one interactions, overwhelmingly positive reaction to the set of actions we've taken. Um, I think we, that said, and I suspect every company in America is dealing with this dynamic as well, uh, we, we, we've seen some increased polarization. Uh, when we have a, a subset of vocal employers uh, who feel like they've been left out of these conversations, um, and, and you see it in our engagement response. I don't feel like my demographic is represented. Um, this goes against how I was raised in terms of being colorblind. All lives matter. Those, those, those pop up and, and they're clustered in the departments where we have less diverse representation than, than the rest of the company. And I listen, I think that is a very challenging discussion and debate about how to address that. Um, on the one hand, I think it's completely natural. If you think about what we did, we stomped on the accelerator, we dramatically sped up the car, and we left some people behind. Uh, and and how do we figure out how to how to retrieve those people and bring them back, uh, and and make sure we're not leaving them alienated back uh, behind us as we go forward. A very rich discussion to be had around that that I think we're still trying to figure out. And, and we've, we've benefited from, from Howard Ross as an advisor, uh, but the, the expression that you can't grow a plant by yanking on it uh, is, is, uh, has come to mind several times as we try to think through how do we manage this dynamic. Uh, and I think will be one of the challenges in front of us for the next year. And I suspect one of the challenges a lot of the other uh, people in the audience are, are trying to manage as well. No question about it. Uh, 
but you know, we are a microcosm of the larger society. So anything that we see uh, that's going on in society is going to affect us internally. No question Absolutely. about that. But I, again, I think some of the some of the conversation has to be. Two things can be true at the same time, and so even when we have we've used our voices and our efforts uh, to at least minimize uh, the polarization. But, but at the same time, uh, we want to hear those, even dissenting voices, because they have a place. Absolutely. And uh, Absolutely. we need to hear those as well because we can't afford uh, to shut down any voices. But I think the way we have the conversations it's in a way that we're not reading our biographies into other people's lives. Our backgrounds, our experiences, and our exposure might be different, but ultimately our mission is to serve our members. And I think we do that well when we do it together. So I, I, I do agree with you. That's well said. Yeah, I do agree. Well, now that I give it thought, let, let me ask you a couple other questions. What do you see when we talk about this work? And, I, and, and I'm the guy that calls it work because it is hard work. And what I try not to do uh, in my role is to be an activist or an advocate because I think the business imperative in this work, you made me think of something, during COVID, those companies, McKinsey uh, did a study, the companies uh, that were more diverse actually fared better during COVID than less diverse or non-diverse companies. And so I know under your leadership, we've always talked about it from a business imperative, not as an outlier, not as uh, just something we do to check a box, but I'm glad that here, and I, and I would say this to the audience, uh, because the work that we do in this area has a direct bearing on the bottom line in many cases. And so I'm, I'm glad that we here at Blue Cross look at it from that standpoint. Uh, we take that type of leadership. And so I would encourage uh, our communities and each one of you uh, to be more intentional, there's that word, uh, to be more intentional in your efforts around diversity and inclusion. Uh, listen, I think the business case for diversity and inclusion is well made at this point. Um, resiliency, levels of innovation, just, you know, baseline revenue, margin growth, those type of, uh, those type of measurements. I, and I, and I'd like to believe it impacts all aspects of our company. It's who we are. Uh, but I just one example for us where I think it is exquisitely important uh, is in our is in our blue care business is in our is in our ten care business. Uh, we serve the state Medicaid program. I think we are we are privileged to be able to serve some of the state's most vulnerable members. Uh, and when we go up to uh, to compete for that account, as we do every so number of years. It is uh, critically important that we can say that whether it's our call center, whether it's our home health nurses, whether it's our care coordinators, whether it's our senior leadership team or our board, that our entire company is representative of the community and the people that we serve. Uh, and frankly, very few, if any, of our competitors can say that. Yeah, I just think that's such a great uh, program for us and the things that we do and the people leading that are so passionate about serving uh, that particular population, you can't beat it. And so, yeah, I agree. I, I really feel good about that work. But I also feel good uh, about uh, the emphasis that we put on closing health care disparities, uh, trying to make sure people have access to care. Those those things are important too when you start talking about inclusion. You know, again, it's more than just checking a box. It's dealing with the whole person. And so I, I'm happy that we have those types of activities, initiatives, consideration as part of our structure, part of our business, uh, that, that we do that. So I'm, I'm, I think it's great. Uh, listen, if I think about the work ahead for us, we have no shortage 
of internal priorities where we can improve. We've got some outlier departments still that need more diversity, um, where I think we can get creative in thinking about how we expand and secure the talent pipeline. And th things like Blue Sky, the... the uh, Why don't uh, you talk about that just well, let, me, let me come back to that if I could. <laughs> but, uh, listen, I, we've got world-class analytical capabilities. I think we still have room to bring those to bear in terms of demonstrating that our pay processes and our promotions are fair and transparent. Um, you and I have talked about this before. I think we could invest uh, uh, large uh, amounts of time and energy on trying to increase the, the, the leadership capabilities around this topic for our managerial staff, our manager level folks. Uh, but just to come back around to what you said earlier, I think where I get most excited about what we can do is externally, particularly around culturally competent care. Uh, I think we have a unique skill set in that, given who we've served in our business for the last uh, two decades. Uh, but I think we still have room to formalize that, improve it, bring it out to all lines of business. And if I think about the, the next horizon for us, uh, I think that's a, that's a very rich place for us to invest further. Good. You know, you've, you've mentioned this a couple of times, either directly or indirectly. We've done some good work. We have some great leadership from the board level throughout our organization. But neither one of us is naive, and we know that we'll never really spike the ball. Mm -hmm. But I'm okay with operating in the red zone uh, as much as possible. We have outliers. Uh, we have all the isms that people uh, bring to the table. Uh, but the work continues, and so we continue the work internally and externally and you talked a, bit, a little bit about it, and I know the audience probably doesn't know a lot about it, but our Blue, Blue Sky program. You want to give it a plus? Sure, sure. Uh, I'll try to link it back. So I think there are a few areas where the talent supply is just not very deep uh, uh, in terms of diverse candidates. Accountants, actuary, uh, and in particular some of the most competitive um, information security subsets. We, we're a data science company. Uh, if you think about where we add value to our members, if you think about how we differentiate ourselves from our competitors, it is increasingly around data analytics. And we've got over a thousand information security professionals in the building. But at any given point, we've got 50 to 100 open positions. Um, by the way, it's starting salaries of $60,000 and above. We just can't get the quantity and the quality of IS talent that we need. And we certainly can't get the diverse candidates that we need. And so we decided to lean into the space. Um, this is what, we didn't do this lightly. This has been four years in the planning now. We've had some of the best national education consultants at our side helping us to do the design work. But we are studying our own Bachelor of Computing uh, degree. We're doing it uh, with East Tennessee State University, one of our premier colleges in the, in the state, and one of the first IS programs in the Southeast more than 40 or 50 years ago now. Uh, and we, uh, we're going to, we're going to, that campus is going to be located, I'm sorry, that degree, that program is going to be located on our campus. These students are going to sit side by side with our own IS professionals. They're going to learn on our hardware, on our uh, uh, software. Uh, and when they graduate, by the way, in two years, as opposed to the typical four-year degree, uh, they're going to have a guaranteed job. Uh, on the back end. Um, and uh, we're not going to force them to work for us. Uh, we're hoping that's going to work out naturally because uh, uh, they're going to want to work here. We're not going to dock their salary to pay for it. We expect um, that for the majority of these students, this is going to be a zero tuition program. Um, and we are purposefully uh, prioritizing students coming out of the six priority schools here in ha Hamilton County. Um, and we are hoping that over time, with our Future Ready Institute investments, that we can create a real uh, career sector pipeline that starts in middle school, gives people exposure, allow them both to, to, to build skill set, but also potentially test whether they really have a passion here and have it cultivate uh, uh, ultimately in a, in a job in our IS department. And I listen, I, I, this is not... 
about people ask us why are you doing a, a, a bachelor degree? Why isn't this stackable certificates? Uh, and the answer is the, the goal is not to train um, the next generation of entry level programming talent. The goal is to train the next level of, uh, of senior leadership at Blue Cross. Uh, again, I, uh, we're a data science company, and whether it's the next CEO or the, or the one after that, uh, the background is going to be in data science. And, and so our, our goal here uh, is, to, is to create a talent pipeline for ourselves uh, uh, where we have unique access to uh, diverse candidates that we wouldn't have otherwise, again, as a business priority. Uh, as much as at anything else. I think it's absolutely great. I'm fascinated every time I hear about it. That excites me. Uh, the six scholarships we give, $10,000 scholarship to young people uh, who are going into any field of medicine and the, and the emphasis that the organization puts on the educational uh, opportunities for our young people. Uh, I, think, I think it's just wonderful as we continue to build the pipeline, build that talent pipeline, as well as to ready our organization for the next level of leadership. You, you, you have to be ready. And I think we're doing some good work in that area. Still have much to do. Still have much to do. Uh, but I think it's important that these types of steps be taken. And we want everybody to know we're doing it, not in a bragging kind of way, but the future of work has changed. And so thanks to you and the organization for doing those types of things. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. And I would listen, I would say we, we treat Blue Sky as open code, open source. Uh, and our expectation is that uh, ETSU or other Tennessee post-secondary institutions can pick this model up. They can take the curriculum with them if they want, uh, and they can replicate it at, uh, at other companies across Tennessee and elsewhere. Uh, we're certainly not unique in, uh, in not being able to secure the amount of uh, IS talent that we need. Absolutely, and not only are we talking there about uh, minorities, and, uh, but we're also talking about women. Absolutely. Uh, we, Absolutely. we understand, I, I was talking with our chief information officer just a couple of weeks ago about the gap that exists for women in leadership roles in the IS industry. And so it's really important that these, our, our candidates are gonna be very inclusive. Absolutely. And so we're also trying to bridge that gap as well. Uh, the, and, and IS is a, is a, is a, is a skill set that anyone with the right exposure and the right passion should be able to learn. Yeah. Exciting times. <laughs> Thanks, Exciting sir. Time. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Well, thank you for your leadership uh, because, you know, I always say that if you call yourself a leader and nobody's following you, you're not a leader. You're just out for a walk. And so uh, leadership is, is just critical. So we're just so grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you.